see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'm here today with uh, Patricia Jennings to talk about uh, empathy. Uh, thank you for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. And you go by Tish as well, so? Yes, okay. yes call me Tish. Oh, great. So um, the way that I kind of uh, heard about you was I saw that there's this uh, program, the Program on Empathy, Awareness, and Compassion in Education at uh, Penn State, and, the, oh, you're, yeah. and you're the uh, co-director of that. So. I immediately said, "Oh, got to talk to talk to these people," and you know, connected you, connected with you, and kind of lined up this interview. So I just wanted to find out, you know, kind of a little bit about yourself, your background, your interest in empathy, and about your uh, program that you're doing. Sure. Um, okay, where do I start? Uh, um, the the program at, at Penn State. Um, is basically part of the Prevention Research Center and those of us who are involved in it are doing research to test the efficacy of different interventions that we hope promote empathy among other things, compassion, resilience, um, responsiveness, self-regulation, those are all things that we're working on. Uh, my pro program in particular is called um, Care for Teachers. Um, CARE stands for Cultivating Awareness and Compassion in Education. And we developed it at the Garrison Institute, where I also work. Um, I direct the education program there. And what, uh, to just kind of step back, I have been very interested for a long, long time. Actually, we were just talking about the Bay Area. Um, I used to teach at St. Mary's College, which is just over the hill from you. Um, and I taught teachers in their education program. Uh, and I was supervising student teachers, so I was going out to schools and observing schools, many of which are near you. And then um, I was teaching the same teachers classroom management. And I became really interested in how emotion reactivity um, interferes with teachers' compassion and empathy and ability to understand what's going on with their students and, um, and also their inability to manage difficult behaviors. And a lot of it kind of boils down to empathy because if if you're reactive, if you're emotionally reactive, it's very difficult to understand the other person's um, perspective. And then your response to that person may not be the appropriate response, especially the, from a student-teacher relationship. So the CARE program is designed to help teachers um, overcome the, the tendencies, the emotional tendencies uh, that they find themselves in when they're teaching. Because you can imagine being in a classroom full of 25 children who are not listening to you and you're supposed to be delivering this information to them and uh, you know it can be really emotionally um, challenging and at the same time you're supposed to be socially it's not socially appropriate to get upset with kids although they do um, so it's a it's a very uncomfortable situation sometimes that teachers find themselves in and they don't they're not given any tools for how to work past that challenge of, of how to deal with a, a, a moment when you're feeling so emotionally upset. Um, but you know it's not appropriate to dump this on the students in your classroom. Yeah, so there's, uh, you, in a classroom, there's a lot of stresses and strains and, and then, you know, you kind of get overwhelmed and then maybe, you know, kind of lash out or something like that. So how do you kind of keep that sense of, uh, of composure and connection and and groundedness kind of yeah exactly uh -huh. yeah so um, what we've learned over the last five years or so where we've been researching this is that the first step is to start recognizing how you're feeling and um, noticing it's, it's a sort of like a self empathy because you have to be able to understand how you're feeling in order to regulate it so uh, we use a lot of different techniques um, that help teachers feel the, emo the, the, the feelings, the sensations, the somatic experience of an emotion. So that when they start feeling hot or tense, this, you know, a lot of teachers report that when they, their shoulders start creeping up is when they're feeling angry. So if you can notice your shoulders doing this before, or, or like an edge will come on your voice, you'll start to get a harsher kind of voice. Then you can stop yourself and go, wait a minute, you know, this is a signal to me that I need to calm down. You know, I need to calm down so I can really see what's happening here. 
Uh, otherwise, I may flip my lid. Um, we work with one of our advisors is Dan Siegel, who you may have heard oh, of. Oh, yeah. Before. And he uses this metaphor, which I really love, that, you know, here's your limbic system where um, your emotional reactivity is seated here. And here's your prefrontal cortex that helps you regulate your emotional responses. Mm -hmm. Well, when you, when you lose control of that, you're basically flipping your lid, mm -hmm. you know. And we teach teachers about that, that we're going to help them learn to keep their lid on. Um, but in a way that's not harmful to their bodies and stressful. Because what happens is they're keeping their lid on like uh -huh, this, With force, you know? yeah, and will and discipline. Yeah, like, uh -huh. yeah, you know, uh, so um, that's, that's one of the metaphors we use in, in working with teachers. And they love it because nobody has really looked, helped them with this. And, you know, by nature, teachers are very compassionate, caring people. That's why else would you become a teacher? Um, and one of the reasons why right now 50% of teachers are leaving within five years of being of entering the profession is because they haven't been given the skills to um, keep their hearts open and keep their empathy uh, functioning in the midst of some of these really difficult settings. Well, how did you get uh, interested in empathy in this whole line? What kind of started you on this journey to where you are now? Um, well, it goes way back. Um, I started practicing mindfulness a long, long time ago as a means of managing my own emotional reactivity as a result of some trauma in my life. And I found it very helpful for me personally, but I never, it was back in the 70s and the 80s when, you know, it wasn't really something, I didn't really understand how it might apply in a, in the, in a classroom context. Although, I probably was using it all the time I was teaching. Um, I taught for 22 years myself. And I did find that my own ability to be empathetic um, was quite dependent on my own ability to be calm and reflective. And that mindfulness helped me be more calm and reflective. Um, and it wasn't until after I started teaching teachers that I felt really frustrated. Like, how, how can I teach this to teachers? I knew it myself, but I didn't really understand how to teach it. And so um, I quit teaching, uh, and I went back to, to college, and that was when I went to UC Davis and studied human development there, uh, and that's where I got my doctorate. And I really focused on stress, coping, emotions, and mindfulness. Those were the, the areas I was focusing on. And then I had this wonderful opportunity to work at UCSF on a project called Cultivating Emotional Balance that came out of the meetings that the Dalai Lama was having with scientists from the Mind and Life Institute. And Paul Ekman, who's uh, an emotion researcher, very renowned, who's in the Bay Area, actually, who used to be a professor at UCSF. I've inter uh, I interviewed him. Oh, great. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, he's wonderful. He's wonderful. I, re I really, um, a lot of what I do, I have to credit him for. He's been a really fantastic mentor. Um, and then Alan Walls, who's a meditation teacher and uh, Mark Greenberg, who's also a really important mentor for me, um, they um, developed this program that combined mindfulness and emotion skills, and they called it Cultivating Emotional Balance, and they decided to test it on teachers, and because they knew teachers had a lot of emotional stress. And so when I found out about that, I went, oh, this is what I want to work on. And I got on the project and started working on it and realized that, well, this is an important point. I think to be compassionate and empathetic and, and self-regulated in a particular context requires training that's contextualized. And that was something I learned from my work with um, see, Cultivating Emotional Balance because that's a generic program for anybody. It's not specifically for teachers. And it helped the teachers, but what I was interested in is not only helping them calm down and be relaxed, but helping them be more present for their students, to empathize with their students, to be more responsive to their students. And we didn't see that in the early research we did. So that's why we developed CARE, because it's more specific to the context. Um, we developed it with a, a team of teacher, former teachers. Um, so we all knew that stress. We all knew what goes on in your mind as a teacher and how to target these skills to that particular context. Mm. So when you say the context, do you mean the context of teaching, but in kind of real world con is context, not abstract, or I wasn't quite sure on the, what you meant by context. Yeah, um, like if you learn a general stress reduction technique, okay, um, that just as general, um, but it, but you may not translate it into a particular setting that you're mm. dealing 
<laughs> so what we do, and, and this is how we do it, um, the way we help them work with their um, challenging emotions is using uh, role plays that they come up with. So let's say, for example, I have a parent that I'm dreading talking to because I know she's going to yell at me, right? And she, her kid is really difficult. And, you know, what am I going to do in this situation? So and I know that it's going to upset me. Um, so we role play that. You know, we have somebody pretend they're that parent. And the, the teacher tells that person, this is what you should say to me, you know? And so they act it out. And it gives them a chance to go, oh, wow look what I'm doing. I immediately want to, you know, get defensive or I immediately, you know, they, they've noticed their reaction in that context. So that's a little different than, uh, you know, a businessman having to negotiate a contract with a, you know, a, a person that's giving them a trouble. You know, every kind of little context, these techniques may need to be, um, tailored for that specific context. That's what I mean. Like, uh, another context is, um, managing challenging behavior of a student at a particular time. I'm sorry, my dog is barking in the back. Um, so, you know, that's a unique context uh, that most adults don't find themselves in. For one thing, when you're a teacher in a classroom, um, wait a minute, Lucy, come here. Lucy, come. Come here. Come here. Um, when, sorry, when you're at teacher in a classroom and something upsets you, you can't just take a break. You know, if you're in an adult context, like office or whatever, and your colleague is giving you a hard time or your boss is giving you a hard time, if you start getting upset, you know that you need a break. You can go say, hey, you know what, let's talk about this later. I need a cup of coffee. I'll talk to you in a few minutes. You know, you can take a break, right? Well, when you're in a classroom full of kids, you can't do that. You have to regulate yourself in that moment. Um, and that's particularly hard. So that, that's why I say that context is, has its own challenges. And then the context is also that the actual, uh, the actual challenges that one might have or the situations one can actually do role playing and, and practice uh, going through the process with others um, as yeah, well. So they, so. Yeah, so what they do when they do that is they, they learn how to reflect on how they're feeling um, and also the thoughts that are associated with those feelings so that they can understand what their tendency to respond is. Um, and t teachers tell me all the time that they have these incredible recognitions. Like here's, a, here's an example. Um, I had one teacher who was doing a role play and I, I was actually playing the, the role of the child for her. And she said, I want you uh, to, I'm going to introduce a new activity to you with a lot of enthusiasm. And what I want you to do is, is make a face and go, Meh, like that, like like you hate it and it's stupid, right? I said, okay. So we acted this out and she said, oh, kids, we're going to do this wonderful thing today. And I went, meh, you know, and she, she went, she immediately wanted to say something to me or stop me or get mad at me. And then she realized, you know, that when she was a kid, she used to do that to her mother. And her mother used to say to her, don't give me that face. So her tendency is to say to that kid, don't give me that face. So she's not being empathetic. She's not recognizing when she's doing that, she's not noticing that that's her, a pattern. But in that role play, she was able to pick that up and go, oh, this child, I'm not, I'm not empathizing with this child. I'm, I'm identifying with this child and I'm reacting because of my own script about some past behavior. So helping them get through that, overcome that automatic tendency could call it their default parameter or whatever that allows them to go wait a minute I don't have to respond to that situation that way maybe just ignoring that student is really the best thing to do because I'm giving her some attention for something that you know maybe isn't appropriate you know maybe maybe you know maybe there's other things that are motivating her um, another thing that I always say to teachers that is really interesting is when I teachers used to come to me with problems because um, you know I was like their coach the student teachers and, they, and they'd say, look, I've tried everything. I don't know what else to do. And I'd say, well, what have you tried? And they'd say, well, I've tried this and this, as if there's only two possibilities of things to try. <laughs> you know, because they see that they're, they're narrow-minded when they're that upset. They're not seeing all the possibilities, the thousands of possibilities of ways to respond to that situation. I mean, you could laugh. You could say, that's a really funny face. You know, you could, who knows? You know, there's a lot of things you could do. Um, but anyway, so 
those are those are the various um, ways that we help teachers mm. be present and responsive and empathetic to their students. Well, you seem very enthusiastic and very excited about this uh, program. Like you really seem to be enjoying it. Oh, this, this is this is kind of the culmination of my life's work. I really love it. It's you know it's the culmination of you know thirty plus years of of a career that is coming to a place where I feel like I'm making a, a I'm hopefully making a really huge contribution. I hope. Um, we have a big study going on in New York City right now. Um, we're going to be recruiting 32 schools, uh, 300 teachers, and about oh, 5,000 students to see. You know, we've we've already shown that this program helps teachers. We've we've shown that in previous research. But what we haven't shown yet is by helping teachers in this way, can we help students? And you know, does it does it does this empathetic response change children's behavior? And so that's what we're going to be looking at next. Hmm. So it sounds like you're kind of, you have kind of two uh, parts to this. One is you're actually doing research into the, into this, and also creating a curriculum that you're impl actually doing the training on. Yeah, it, um, it is really both. Um, I think I'm in a really unique position because there's not very many people that go from being teacher to researcher. You know, it's it's a kind of an unusual career path. And so I am a curriculum developer, and I've done a lot of t professional development for teachers for a long time, but now I'm a, kind of a new researcher. I graduated from UC Davis in 2004, so I'm you know, relatively um, late into the career, in the research career, but the, putting them together has been really exciting because when you create something and then you test it and you show that it works, that's an exciting thing to do. It's, it's really thrilling, actually. What is kind of uh, the general outline of the curriculum, kind of uh, just kind of the bullet points of what it looks like? Sure. Um, there's a lot of detail at our website, which is www.care4, the number four, teachers.org. Um, but uh, it has three major components. Um, one is emotion skills training. So it's information and knowledge and, and practical skills in how to recognize and understand and and regulate emotion. Um, it involves some a large number of mindfulness-based or mindful awareness practices um, that are very diverse because we're trying to give teachers a lot of different options of things that they might like to try, like uh, walking um, practice, mindful walking, mindful movement, mindful breath awareness, um, uh, mindful eating. Um, uh, uh, and we do listening activities. We, we have a whole section of the curriculum that is focused on compassion and empathy. And it's our, we use listening as a practice to help them. Uh, and this is, this is a really interesting practice. It's listening mindfully and feeling how you're feeling at the same time that you're listening without feeling the need to respond to the person. So that you're just being there. You're just being present and listening. And we start this practice by using a poetry because it's very non, it's not personal. Um, you know, a person reads a poem to another and they're just listening and they practice just this, pra you know, be just being open and open to the other person's expression. And then we use that technique to help them talk about things that are more emotionally um, challenging uh, and to watch themselves and feel themselves as they do that. And then the listener is holding the space for them, you know, being a, a compassionate listener while they express whatever they're listening they're saying and so what they learn is that you can really help a person by simply listening you don't have to say anything you don't have to solve their problems you don't have to give them any suggestions just being there makes a huge difference for people is what we're finding and then the final thing that we teach is um, a, a secular adaptation of the the loving kindness practice which, which we call caring practice um, and it's basically um, a, a reflective practice where they think about um, themselves and then another person they're close to and then a neutral person and then finally a challenging person. And as they do it, <coughs> excuse me, they offer well-being, happiness, and peace to that person, themselves, the other, other people in their mind. And so it's a reflective practice that generates this sense of care and compassion and empathy uh, it's like an open-heartedness that, that comes from that. 
Um, we don't tell them how they're going to feel when they do that because we want them to express experience it. But almost all of them say after doing that exercise that they feel this open, warm feeling in their hearts. So, mm -hmm. so um, what are the uh, kind of the um, the the uh, roots of that program? It seems like one of them is uh, kind of the mindfulness community, the meditative mindfulness community. I heard some uh, kind of like active listening. A uh, bit of the maybe the Carl Rogers, you know, kind of empathic listening. I wonder if there's kind of other traditions kind of feeding into that that you would say. Well, one is um, well, Dan Siegel is one of our our advisors. Paul Ekman is one of our advisors. Mark Greenberg is one of our advisors. I'm trying to think of. Um, then also, um, we owe a lot to Barbara Fredrickson. Um, do you know her work, Positivity? Um, <clears throat> you should. Definitely talk to her. Um, she, she has a website called PositivityRatio.com or org, something like that. And uh, <clears throat> she's done a lot of research on positive emotions and what effects they have on people. And she and we do um, some of the emotion activities we do are um, emotion induction activities. So you can basically, through using your memory, you can trigger an, a positive emotion in you and savor it. Um, and it, the, learning how to do that is really wonderful because when you know that you can make yourself feel happy whenever you want to, um, that's a real amazing uh, experience. So we teach them that. We teach them doing that with joy and gratitude. Um, so Barbara Fredrickson, um, I would say Carl Rogers probably is one of the roots. I hadn't thought about it that way, but one of our co-developers, Krista Turksma, um, is, was a Rogerian therapist and a teacher before. So um, I think that we do owe a lot to that. And then <clears throat> the other developer is Richard Brown, who's the, um, the uh, head of contemplative education at Naropa University. So I think we owe a lot to Naropa as well. Some of the ways we're adapting mindfulness practices um, come from Naropa. Um, <clears throat> I think if I'm missing anything. Um, you know, most of the ex other emotion exercises we do come from Paul Ekman. So... So it's They're bringing in a lot of the uh, kind of the latest science as well to the, the mindfulness, yeah. the science. And how about the arts? Do you uh, integrate any the arts as well? Um, we well, well, oh, first of all, let me back up a little bit. Also, I want to give credit to Richie Davidson. Um, he's at you know uh, University of Mad oh, Wisconsin Madison. <clears throat> he's a um, he focuses on neuroscience of emotion, and a lot of the information that we deliver in our training comes from his work. So I, you know, got to give him a shout out too. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, um, when we do the program as a retreat um, every year in August, this year it's August 10th through the 16th, we do care as a retreat at the Garrison Institute. And when we do it as a retreat, we do integrate the arts because we have time to do that. Um, we've done collage work. We've done um, we've done a whole variety of different kinds of arts. Um, we kind of do it as an, on an ad hoc basis, you know, depending on who's there and who wants to lead it. Um, and when we do it in the field, so to speak, when we do it in for a, a school district, you know, while teachers are working in the field, we don't we don't use that very often. Um, we just don't have time to, to explore that that much. Well, um, I was kind of wondering about your uh, definition of empathy because when I, Paul, I interviewed uh, Paul Ekman, you know, he said uh, he was really interested in, in compassion. He says to get to compassion, you have to go through through empathy. So he did a lot of research on on empathy. He says, "Oh, it's such a morass. I had the, you know, it, the vocabulary and how people are using the word and all that." So I was kind of wondering how you're kind of uh, defining or you know, kind of your working definition of empathy. Well, I think um, I kind of have a really simple, I mean, I, I totally would defer to Paul on this, but I, the way I, my working definition is that empathy is the ability to recognize another person's feelings. And I think, you know, I was looking up a little bit about this before I talked to you too, because I wanted to sort of look at the etymology of it. And it's really about being in emotion. Em, you know, emp empathy means in emotion, literally in the, from the Greek. So I'm thinking, you know, it's like feeling how another person is feeling or knowing how another person is feeling. I don't know if you necessarily have to feel how they're feeling, but you need to understand how they're feeling. You need, I think it's more than just feeling, though. I think it's also perspective. Taking, like, understanding 
not only how the person's feeling, but why they're feeling that way, like what their thought processes might be that might be triggering their reaction. And I think a general knowledge of emotion helps you do that. And that's one of the reasons why we do all this emotional instruction, because when you see a look on somebody's face and you know what that signals, and then you can understand the motive behind that emotion, you might be able to understand their behavior better. Um, and when you can do that, then you can sh you can respond compassionately because you understand them. And now I think the difference is compassion is more of an action. It's more of a response. It's trying to help. It's trying to it's trying to do something to re relieve the suffering. Whereas empathy is feeling or know is knowing or being aware of the suffering. So that's how I kind of think of them. And the other thing I think is really important in terms of emotion reactivity and and compassion is that sometimes when you are empathetic, you get flooded with that emotion. Like, for example, if you see somebody really upset or you see an accident or trauma, you may get so upset that you can't do anything. You, you may f fall down and cry and turn into a puddle. So you can be very empathetic in that situation, but you can't do anything because you're, you're just overwhelmed with that emotion. So to be compassionate, to have a compassionate response, requires emotion regulation so that you can calm down and so that you can function, so you're not swept away by the emotion of the other person. Uh, I find that sometimes uh, just kind of looking at metaphor kind of kind of illuminates it a bit. And I think it also kind of combines that, that brain, you know, the prefrontal and the amygdala, that metaphor kind of ties the two together. So empathy is often, you know, even defined as the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes or looking through someone else's eyes. And for me, empathy is like a cornucopia because it's it's kind of, we all are kind of a cornucopia of feelings. And when we can empathize with each other, we kind of share that cornucopia. It's like a double cornucopia maybe. So uh, kind of, do you have a kind of your own creative uh, personal metaphor that you could come up with? It's a bit of a, you know, on the spot, but. Well, this is, I don't really have a metaphor, but. <laughs> I'm going to take you way off, <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure. Um, one of the things I'm very interested in is, is human evolution. And um, um, I don't know if you realize this, but since the Genome Project, they've, re they've discovered that we all evolved from a very, very small population of about 10,000 people about 70,000 years ago. And so we are way, way more related and less diverse than we ever thought. Um, so one of the ways we survived, they think, is because during that time period, the Homo sapiens developed these really, really, really advanced prefrontal cortices. This part of the brain really evolved during that time. And it allowed us to empathize and to understand other and to communicate and to plan. And to, it helped us create a, a future and a past, which we didn't have before. So it really allowed the flourishing of culture to happen. Because once you have culture, you have transmission of knowledge in a totally different way than we had before. Um, and so I think this empathy is this collective connection that we all have. You know, I, th I see it as that we are all connected on one level. We must be. We must be incredibly well, you know, connected more than we ever realized. And that just the recognition of that connection is, is a really deep kind of empathy. Um, because we all are the same. We all have the same. We are so similar. It's unbelievable. Um, and so whatever you're feeling, I've probably felt before, <laughs> you know, it's not, like the human experience is, is, is not, is, is very unitary in a, in a lot of ways. So I think that, you know, knowing well, that is really important. Well, I thought you were kind of going towards this, uh, what, something I heard recently about like a herd, uh, that they all, if you think of a herd, every animal has eyes and if danger happens, suddenly they, you know, one will tense up and then that will kind of empathically sweep and put everybody in the herd kind of on guard. So the herd acts as kind of like a single unit and it's kind of like empathy that kind of conveys that, uh, that experience. So that, and that, that could be like a benefit of empathy. Yeah, I mean, you see that with children and adults too because children look at adults for signals about what, how to act, how to feel you know and they they look at their teachers they look at their parents and and if their parents are stressed out or their teachers are freaked out that's going to make them concerned you know because those are the adults you know and so it's like the herd mentality it's like the leader of the herd is going ah 
And so the kids are all going, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, no wonder uh-huh. we have a whole classroom of kids going, ah. Uh-huh. That's good. Uh huh. Yeah. So if the teacher is freaking out, it's going to, can just have ripple effects throughout the whole classroom and kind of accentuate, yeah. And if the teacher is calm and centered, exactly. it's gonna kind of ripple out to, as, as well, so. Um, One well, of the things I used to do, let me just tell you a funny mm-hmm. story. When I, when I was teaching teachers, I gave them this experiment. These were my student teachers I was supervising. I said, do you ever feel freaked out? And they go, oh yeah, all the time. I said, next time you feel freaked out, just sit down in the classroom, just sit down and take a couple breaths, don't do anything, just sit, close your eyes for a minute and just calm down and then open your eyes and look around and see what's going on. And invariably they would say, oh my goodness, it was like a miracle, they all calmed down. (laughs) And what we didn't know was whether they were already calm and they just, it was them that was upset or whether them calming down actually did calm down their class. We never actually were able to study that but I think it's really interesting phenomenon. Oh so is that the kind of research you're doing is really trying to see how these uh, different phenomena and how they kind of work and well unfortunately we're not down to that fine of a level of, of research I, I would love to do that but that's just sort of anecdotal from when I used to teach teachers but um, I, I do believe that that's happening I just not sure how to measure it yet <laughs> The problem with research is you always have to figure out measurement strategies, and that's the hard part. Um, but I've seen it with you know happen, so um, you know I know I have that amount of knowledge. But when it comes to science, you have there's a higher bar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, well, we were talking a little bit about the definition of empathy, and you know I've been looking at this for a couple of years now. I've been trying to synthesize these, and mm-hmm. so I've kind of created a definition. Um, which is kind of empathy is four parts. So maybe I could just kind of throw that out there and get your take on it. Sure. And, and you'd actually mentioned the first one, I think, uh, when we first started talking is self-empathy, kind of that self-awareness, mindfulness of what's going on inside of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that as we have kind of like, a, you know, our more calm, more open, you know, our kind of awareness can open and we become receptive to uh, kind of mirrored empathy. Uh, or emotional or affective empathies, a lot of the scientists, uh, academics seem to call it. Whereas to mirror neurons, we can kind of reflect. So as I'm waving my arms around here and you're smiling, we're kind of like, you know, mirroring that in each other. And, you know, I'm feeling a little a bit of your smile. Maybe you're feeling a bit of the, the waving hands. So that's kind of this mirrored, um, through mirrored uh, mirror neuron empathy. And then there's the uh, imaginative empathy or, you know, perspective taking cognitive empathy, where is we realize that we're separate um, uh, entities, you know, we have self-awareness and, you know, children at 18 months or so kind of develop that sense of recognizing themselves in the mirror as a separate um, kind of person that uh, then we start are able to kind of take the perspective uh, in put ourselves into the role of someone else. And then the uh, fourth part is empathic action. And that's that um, when we kind of line those up and have that kind of connection uh, with others, that we naturally, when we see someone else, we naturally want to contribute to their well-being. And so if they're happy, we want to, you know, double their happiness. If they're, you know, in pain, we want to, you know, uh, ameliorate their pain so um and everything in between you know the happiness and pain so the empathy really addresses the whole spectrum of uh you know of action of interaction and kind of wanting just basically the well-being of others and then uh, i had talked to paul about this too about uh the that compassion is like he called it a, a slice of empathy in that it's the component where um, it's kind of like empathy applied to the suffering of someone else and and kind of what's the dynamic. And it kind of, uh, you know, kind of parallels the empathy in, in like the work of Kristen Neff, you know, with self-compassion, you know, being kind of mindful, non-judgmental of your own, uh, you know, pain or suffering, stresses and, you know, um, and, and it kind of follows the same path and want to have compassionate action. Um, 
So that's mm -hmm. kind of like a kind of a model I've been kind of operating from and just wondering how that uh, kind of resonates with your understanding. I like that. I think your, um, your empathy that's sort of action oriented, I don't remember what you called it. Um, empathic action. Empathic uh -huh. action to me sounds a lot like compa my idea of compassion. I mean that I, I don't, I mean, sometimes it's targeted towards, I know that, you know, as Paul was saying, it's like, uh, related to somebody's suffering, but I think it, it can be broader than that. It doesn't have to be just suffering. It can just be in the, you know, feeling of, of care for everyone. Um, and so I, I think at that point, our definitions are very similar um, for compassion and, and, and empathy. Um, I think that's a great kind of overlap place for those two. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I really like, I like the way you're, you're talking about that. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think if I have anything else to add to that. I, I like it a lot. Yeah, I've, I've been just trying to synthesize and it's bringing different communities because um, there's there's a lot of, you know, the mindfulness community, scientific community, even the scientific community kind of splits with using it. And I, I interviewed uh, uh, Dan Batson and we went through his eight, you know, ways that he just at least the minimum, you know, this is the minimum I found is eight ways how empathy is kind of like uh, actually used. And he said, you know, none of them are right or wrong. It's just that you have to kind of define your terms before you're and be consistent when you're kind of talking about it. And so mm -hmm. I've been kind of looking how to kind of merge these together. And so far, that's my best guess. So I'm kind of like testing it out on people and just seeing how it resonates. Well, I think anytime we can find ways to help people understand empathy and, and promote empathy. And um, because, I mean, I think ultimately empathy is, is a very um, comfortable place to be. When you're feeling empathy for another person, you're feeling connected to them. You're feeling like you're part, you're, 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 um, there's something really deeply connected with the other person. And it's really nice. So you're, you're not feeling uh, alone, separate, but you're feeling connected to a larger um, group of people or individual people. So um, I, I like the idea of promoting it and finding ways to communicate across different um, platforms, so to speak. Yeah. You know, anthropology, the psychology, the human development, the education, um, the, the neuroscience, the, you know, psychiatrists, you know, you've got a lot of different um, uh uh, places yeah, where it's disciplines out there that kind of use it a little bit differently and have a different uh, little slant different see it they see have a different perspective on it um, so uh, yeah what you were kind of getting into is the felt experience of empathy and that's another thing that I'm really looking at it's like you know it's really about what does empathy feel like in our body when we feel empathy and you know when we really can feel someone else it has a really I think it, you know uh, Carl Rogers said, when you're just kind of heard, you know, without being judged, without all, you know, trying for somebody trying to fix you, he says, it feels damn good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, it's true. It does. And, um, you know, I think to Barbara Fredrickson, you definitely should talk to her. Um, she is, you know, she's sort of done the opposite of Paul Ekman. You know, Paul focused a lot on uncomfortable emotions and he only recently started thinking about what we call comfortable. We don't call them positive and negative in our work because we don't want to put a pejorative label on an uncomfortable emotion like anger. You know, it's, it has its function. It's uncomfortable, but it's not necessarily negative. It could be a very positive emotion under certain circumstances. So um, what she's done, though, is she has looked at the positive or comfortable emotions, and she's found that when you're feeling these emotions, they um, help you broaden and build. They broaden your perspective. They keep your mind open. They, in fact, um, change your perception. They, they increase your peripheral vision, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, they open up your vascular system, you know, um, they, they definitely open you up um, and they also build resilience. So it's kind of like physically, you feel physically more open. It's like you're the constriction in your body actually opens. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what that if you experience enough of that um, and she has a she studied this enough that she even has come up with a ratio. So that's why she calls it positivity ratio. And I think it's three to one. So that 
out of three incidents in a day, two out of them, I'm sorry, two to, two to one, I think. Anyway, I have to go back and look, but a certain proportion of comfortable feelings compared uh, in, in comparison with uncomfortable feelings. So if you have one bad moment, you could have two good moments and they would balance out. And she's tracked people over time and if you keep this ratio, your well-being index is pretty high. Um, if you go down below that in that ratio, you can start suffering from a lot of problems. So she's what she, her theory is is that that's building resilience. The more opportunities you have to savor those good feelings, whatever they happen to be, the the more you're strengthening yourself um, and creating a resiliency that you that will maintain you through rough spots. So mm. um, the more of these feelings we can have, they also nourish us. <clears throat> it's like taking your vitamins, you know. Well, you know, I have this center, which is you kind of see behind me here, the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And it's, it's really about how do we uh, transform society to promote empathy at a societal level. So, um, you know, to kind of consciously raise the level of empathy in society. And a lot of what we've talked about is all about that. I mean, you're doing research about that. You're doing a curriculum. So I'm wondering if you have kind of other kind of general thoughts about how we can transform, you know, really the society in the United States, the culture and the world to uh, have more empathy and compassion. It's a big question. Well, I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this and it kind of goes back to my research on um, and human um, beginnings because I, I we know from our history that that the way we survived was by cooperating and by working together and feeling connected to one another in small groups <laughs> small uh, warring groups <laughs> you know so we had this group over here and we had this group over here and they were very tight-knit and they got along really well but they fought with each other for territory for whatever well we're at a point in our human evolution where we can't afford to do that anymore. We're, we're beyond that. We don't need to do that anymore. Before we were fighting over resources, you know, if we would just get our act together, we have plenty of resources. What we need now is to learn how to get along at a very high level. So we need to keep our lids on <laughs> and remember that we are all in one boat and we are all together and, um, and really help, uh, uh, help one another get past this uh, reactive tendency we have to feel defensive. That I mean, that that reaction that we have, that human, like, uh, defensive posture and defensive reaction comes from these years of warring tribes. You know, and we're we're just past that. We just haven't evolved our culture beyond that, and our bodies are still operating like we're in you know in the in living in a cave. So, but we're not living in caves anymore. You know. So I think this is great, and I'm, you know, I'm happy you're working on this, and I'm happy we're all working on this, and um, I'm happy to share what you're doing. I was, I didn't know this what you were doing, and so um, at the Garrison Institute and in our program at Penn State, we could link with you and build our communities together. Oh, I'd love to do that because I'm really looking at uh, networking, you know, with, through these interviews and doing an online conference so that we can, you know, first uh, interview people like yourselves, other working who are working in this field and then have online panel discussions and just kind of create a kind of a dialogue engine online and then kind of get it out to our, you know, community on, you know, on the social media sites. And so, would you know, would love to kind of keep the dialogue going and look for other ways of, uh, you know, collaborating on, on this. Another person you should talk to is Tim Ryan. Do you know who he is? Mm, I've heard He's the name. Congress He's a congressman oh, from yeah. Ohio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's amazing. He just published a book called The Mindful Nation, and uh, he talks about my program in that book. But he's a really great guy, and he, you know, he's one of the few people in government that is really trying to make a huge difference here. And he gets it. You know, he knows how important empathy is. Mm. So he would be, you know, a good person to talk to too. If you're trying to get a gamut of different people. Yeah. Different have you talked to him? Or oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, do you have his email? Yeah. I mean, you know, I could. You want to pass it on? Well, I can introduce you to him. Okay, um, that'd be cool. His publicist. I, uh -huh. you know, I, I don't feel comfortable doing it directly, but I, okay. I can connect you with oh, okay. him through his publicist. On my. <laughs> okay. You know. anyway. Yeah. Um. You know, Barack Obama. Also, one of my my insp inspirations uh, for this was Barack Obama because during his campaign, he just talked over and over and over about the importance of empathy. 
and said it was his most important value. And that's why he was running was because he thought he could, you know, kind of contribute to bringing uh, people together. So I think it's been a bit more challenging than he expected. I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, we all come to these things with a lot of idealism, and sometimes reality uh, uh, hits us, and it's not what we thought. <laughs> Although, you know, it's it's a tough job, so I got to give him credit for that. Yeah. So. Well, okay. Is there uh, kind of any final uh, thoughts you have uh, that anything that's burning that we could should cover or that hasn't been covered? Yeah, I think um, kids are really key. Um, I think. Uh, this next generation that's growing up, the more we can do to help them grow up to be empathetic, the better. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on adults too, but um, I think that there's a huge uh, benefit, a huge um, uh, benefit to helping kids grow up learning to be empathetic from the beginning, rather than trying to remediate all of us <laughs> adults. That, um, because once you've got a, a child who is an empathetic soul, they're, they're, they're not going to go the other direction. I haven't seen that. Happen. That's just a theory, but I don't think it happens very often. Mm -hmm. So really make it part of the curriculum from, you know, kindergarten all the way through. So I, for myself, if I had learned, uh, you know, conflict resolution, like restorative justice community has this whole conflict resolution kind of processes, uh, which I've learned some of them with mediation. If I had learned those way back in first or second or third grade, it would have served me, you know, really well. Yeah, and children really can learn these things, and they actually sometimes outperform, many times outperform us. So, uh, and they may actually have some keys to empathy that we can't see from our, you know, adult jaded perspectives that would be really interesting to tap into. So, I just encourage if you if you find any young people to talk to about this, mm. um, it might be worthwhile. Another another a group to talk to um, are it's the Holistic Life Foundation, mm -hmm. um, and I'll connect you with them. I can actually send you an email. Um, these are guys that have been doing yoga with um, high risk youth in Baltimore, and they're amazing. And they probably have some kids that you could interview. Actually, oh, that'd be great. And they they're awesome. Um, I'll, I'll link you with them too. So, okay, great. Well, we got some next steps going to kind of keep this dialogue and process going. So this has been wonderful. I'm so glad to have uh, connected with you and had a chance to, uh, hear about this wonderful program. Well, likewise, I'm, I'm glad to find out about what you're doing and, um, it would be great to link, co-link what we're doing. So, um, I'll connect you with the people at Garrison to link up with and, Vice versa, if you can link to Garrison and to our website, too, at Penn State, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. Well, this interview will be online uh, next week when we send it out. We have, like, uh, almost uh, over 50,000 people have signed up for our various <coughs> for our cool. various causes, uh, you know, on Facebook, on Facebook causes. And so it's a, it's a large network. And, you know, you know kind of uh, this is part of kind of doing uh, these interviews, sending it out there. Uh, doing panel discussions, you know, letting people know about it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of part of our uh, ongoing indefinite conference on how to build a culture of empathy and compassion. So, Tish, this has been so wonderful. I'm so, oh, look, there's more. Okay. You. Sorry. Go. <laughs> um, Kimberly Shonert Re Reichel. I'll, I'll send you oh, a okay, link. Okay, you can she's, send those. Uh -huh. she, she's a professor at University of British Columbia, and she... Um, She's an expert in, in empathy, so oh, you should great. definitely talk to her. Um, I'll, I'll link you with her, too. Not only has it been a wonderful conversation, you're a cornucopia of uh, insights and connections, too. So. Well, and if you ever do a, uh, a panel on education, uh, keep me in mind. I'd love to do that. Okay, so. well, we'll definitely do it because we actually have a, a whole section of the conference as a subconference on education. I'll send you the link. Oh, that. fantastic. And we also okay. have a online curriculum project. And we had have like, a, you know, a thousand people that have signed up on that group. And, uh, you know, other people have kind of said they volunteer. So we're trying to, you know, kind of do community online organizing. So uh, I'm definitely going to get you together on a panel with some folks. Okay, great. Um, okay, Sounds good. Good. Tish, All right. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Thank then you. See you soon. Okay. Bye bye. bye.
see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.